Thank you, thank you all for coming. Uh, my, I started thinking about this, um, I have been sort of experimenting with data fusion and geophysics since I started learning about GIS and geophysics um, as an undergraduate, so a long time ago now. Uh, and I was thinking about it more, um, when do I use it, how do I use it, when is it most useful, because I find myself getting stuck when I'm trying to, to communicate the results to sort of a broader audience in an archaeological journal as opposed to communicating it to experts that have a foundation in the remote sensing and in GIS already, and so it's an easy sort of translation. So that's where I sort of began. So I just want to just give a real brief overview of what we're talking about when I say data fusion. It's what most people would call data integration. That's a more commonly used term. Just taking um, various types of remote sensing data, GIS data, putting it together in a wide variety of ways. So we have geophysical data, multispectral data from satellite sensors, from aerial platforms, thermal data from those same platforms, to topographic data from LIDAR, from photogrammetry, um, ground survey data, archaeological survey data, geochemistry, really any spatial data that you can integrate into, um, into a com combined product. So the types of data fusion uh, that I have um, sort of experimented with, uh, you can categorize them in, in this way. You've got really basic, very common, looking at things side by side or overlaid in a GIS, uh, putting data on top of a terrain surface or on top of another, another surface or imagery like satellite imagery. At the feature level, you can do some digitization of your features, so just using your subjective interpretation to digitize vectors or you can extract features using some segmentation or some thresholds and then combine those in a GIS type overlay. <coughs> and then at the pixel level, which is something um, a little bit what Petra was talking about, which is pixel by pixel mathematical operations, um, transparent overlays of, of different uh, raster based images together, composites using red, green, and blue color combinations like that is used in satellite remote sensing, uh, numerical and statistical approaches, just simple arithmetic combinations, additions, ratios, um, divisions, principal components analysis, Boolean logic where you're taking uh, binary versions of your data and integrating them um, by uh, Boolean union or intersection or something like that. Supervised classification and unsupervised classification uh, borrowed directly from satellite remote sensing where you're taking um, you're using statistical patterns to find commonal commonalities between multiple data sets. So the goals of data fusion then are trying to do a number of things. Um, one, to make a more complete visualization when you have multiple data sets. So suppose you have different properties at different depths that you're measuring, so you're trying to integrate those together. Um, reducing the data down to its most important parts, what you deem to be the most important parts, the archaeological features most, in most cases. Uh, putting things in context, so simply just putting your data into the broader geographic context, uh, looking at how it's related to landscape features and so on. Um, looking at improving the accuracy and um, interpretation, uh, the accuracy of your interpretation, so when you have the combination of data. Uh, you have the benefit of multiple properties measured, different, different aspects of the shape and the combination of those things. And then testing other lines of evidence. So if you are trying to just verify one data set by collecting another data set and see if you have some redundancy. Uh, and then finally, improving your data. So an example would be a topographic correction of ground penetrating radar data where you're integrating the topographic information in with that data to improve its accuracy and quality. So in thinking about this, I was thinking back on um, sort of the, the GIS aspect of this and the, the foundations of cartography and GIS and remote sensing. So if you think about um, cartography traditionally practiced before GIS, the, the traditional map was the database. Uh, and so you have here a map of Tubigin with, um, with highways, with cities, and all the information is presented in one place. So it's a storage for information and it is um, also a means of presentation. And that is what we have in our conference pamphlets to find the places to eat. 
But with GIS, we have this opportunity to have this dynamic interface where we have um, the ability then to seemingly play with our data for endless amounts of time to try to understand it better and to really sort of construct knowledge from our data. There seems to be almost no end to it. Um, and so the other sort of piece of the foundation in terms of from the more of a geography perspective is the, the foundations of cartographic visualization. So we have, um, you know, as, uh, as, as humans, we have this incredible power to, to visualize, to see patterns that we have been trying to, uh, scare me. <laughs> we have been trying to, um, we've been trying to get machine learning and um, methods of automatic feature detection to work, and they do work well in some cases, but I still think that um, our ability as humans to, me to recognize patterns um, is pretty powerful. And it's the, the, our ability to visualize and synthesize information um, on that level. And the computer itself is a tool to help us, to aid us in that process. And then the other aspect of sort of the power of the human brain is our domain expertise. That is our ability, our experience, our expertise in our field, in the expertise you have in the archaeological sites you're working at and the data the methods that you're using. So all these things together combined with computational tools like computers um, will allow us to then put together this information and then the ultimate goal is expanding our knowledge. So synthesizing that information and turning it into knowledge. And, and I think cartographic visualization has always been trying to do this even before GIS and it's translating to different sorts of fields um, at different rates. So another, a third piece of sort of older information that kind of plays into this is John Tukey, who is a, an American mathematician. Um, he's known for um, fast Fourier transform algorithm, box plots, um, Tukey range tests, and a bunch of other things, statistically speaking. He also invented the term bit, which is was something we're all familiar with. Um, he referred to natural science and all the sciences that weren't considered a hard science as an uncomfortable science meaning that it wasn't something that you could say a hypothesis, test it, verify or not verify. It's archaeology is in that category where we cannot, we, we cannot really just have test hypothesis and get an exact result. We have to do a lot of interpretation. So he also emphasized the, um, the iterative, iterative nature of data analysis. So the, the need for uh, and the value of reevaluating your data discovering hypotheses, testing them, going back and sort of looking at your data over and over again. Um, I like the idea and what I try to do and what Petra mentioned was um, getting multiple individuals to look at the data and put their heads together. Um, and he also advocated for the practice of exploratory data analysis as a really critical part of the scientific process. So that's sort of the, the, the um, abductive reasoning uh, approach to understanding your data. So I really like this quote from him, from his statistics textbook there in 1977. He says, no catalog of technique can convey a willingness to look for what, we can, what can be seen, whether or not anticipated, yet this is the heart of exploratory data analysis. The graph paper and transparencies are there, not as a technique, but rather as a recognition that the picture examining eye is the best finder we have of the wholly unanticipated. So what he means, he's talking about transparencies and graph paper, that's what we use now with GIS and, and geospatial software. And he's saying that you know these are our tools for knowledge discovery, which is still really true today. Um, and then this is from a geologist, um, David DeBase, and he, he talks about visual thinking and visual communication as really graphics, graphical portrayal of your data, especially visual, uh, cartographic visualization are an integral part of the entire scientific process. So starting with just exploration, collecting your data and processing it and starting to look at it, that I would, I, I would say that, that is, that's where you start to look at data fusion. That's where you start to combine your data. Then when you're looking at confirming your ideas, you're testing your ideas, you're also integrating data in that sort of GIS environment. So you're also doing that. And then when you're synthesizing your data, you're distilling it down perhaps to a product to communicate. Now you're getting out more into the public realm, 
where you're saying that you're combining your data and you're putting it in a format that will be more consumable to a broader audience. And then finally, presentation. If you're presenting at a conference like this, you're presenting more to experts. But if you're presenting at a more broad conference with a broader audience, then you would be um, changing the way that you present your data. You would be making it more general. So I see this as sort of a framework for thinking about data fusion and where it plays a part. And we still have a couple of problems. The problems that we're trying to solve are that our ability as, as humans to interpret data is really not, it's, it's becoming more difficult. I wouldn't say it's no longer possible, but it's becoming more difficult because we have greater data, we have larger data sets, we have higher dimensionality data sets, we have five or six or eight or 10 different um, remote sensing data layers. And so the challenge is then how do you transform that information into knowledge when you're, when you're doing larger, you have larger and larger data sets, you have greater dimensionality and, and greater sizes. I think that the greatest potential, I think that we have realized through computer graphics, through lots of great presentation modalities, we have realized how effective it can be. But um, with, uh, I think that maybe we're not doing, it, it has just as much value in the process than it does in the, in the final presentation. And so I just want to emphasize that point. So I have a, a case study to sort of illustrate this, this idea. Um, it's nothing fantastic. I looked at some of my old data and I wanted to move on to something more recent. Um, so this is sort of a work in progress. Uh, Runyon is the name of a, uh, an archeological site in Tennessee, close to, close to where I, I, uh, my university is. It's in the Appalachian Mountains. This is the state of Tennessee and the state of North Carolina. So it's here in the Southern Appalachian Mountains. <laughs> And um, at this site, oh, I went the wrong way. At this site, um, we have the broad research question. We we know there's a site here because there was an, a a burial eroding out of the river bank, and there's some artifacts on the surface. But there's no um, surface expression other than that. This area is sort of a, a unexplored area in archaeology. Not very much has been done there. We know um, that in this map here, uh, this was made in uh, 2008, these are the areas of Cherokee towns that were known during the period of European contact. And then um, this is a map from the, uh, Cherokee, the Cherokee Nation, um, the Museum of the Cherokee Indian in Cherokee, North Carolina, where the Eastern Band of the Cherokee live. And it's a very, it's a snapshot of their museum exhibit. But what it shows is that there's this area in, in about 1650, this is a map saying this is where the Cherokee were living at the time of European contact. What it doesn't show is that, well, it says that there's really nothing going on up here in Northeast Tennessee, which is where the site Runyon is and, and several other sites. So this area where all these river valleys are, there are a lot of sites up there, but they really haven't been explored very closely. The other question we have about this area is that we know, we, we know that um, Hernando de Soto and Juan Pardo both uh, had expeditions that went from Joara, which is a Cherokee town, over the Appalachian Mountains over to Chiaha. So this is in North Carolina and this is in Tennessee. And we know that they've made that journey and we have descriptions of what they saw, but we don't know exactly what route they took. One of my colleagues uh, did a GIS least cost path analysis, and she determined that the most likely route with a least cost path was down in this direction and up through this valley here, this pass here and down here. But then when she changed the, uh, the resolution of the, um, the terrain data to make it a wider passage, which you would have had a large group of Spanish explorers, cattle, horses, everything, um, it, it changed the path and it took it up north over here down the Watauga River Valley and down the Nolichucky River Valley. So this is the area that we're exploring here with many sites and Runyon is just one of those sites. So that's like the broader research context and then we go to a site like Runyon and we say what is going on here? And so we collected, uh, we started with a magnetometer cart. This is the census MXPDA with five uh, Flexgate radiometers. And, you know, just a very basic data integration, just putting it in on, on the satellite image. This is the Nolichucky River right here flowing to the bottom of the map. 
So this is sort of a first interpretation. And the first thing I noticed were these dark lines here and here. And uh, also a lot of, um, it's harder to see at this scale, but that's a large structure and there's a lot of um, house size structures. So that's sort of the first thing was putting it just in the context. And what that told me was that this could be evidence of fortification or it could be paleo channel scars. So questions. So, so when you're doing, when you're looking at these data, you're really generating more questions than answers, as I'm sure you all have experienced. And so I made a very preliminary interpretation just from these data. This is an area of six hectares, so 200 by 300 meters. And uh, I have just digitized as a subjective interpretation all the things that I see as what appear to be houses in magnetometry data. And so we have a cluster of houses surrounding a large structure here. And so I decided to test my other geophysical instruments over this one large square structure to see what was going on and to see how well the different data work. So another way that I was exploring the data through data fusion or integration was putting it on top of this shaded relief map, map which is from really recently collected LIDAR data. And what it shows is that there's this large structure here, there's a pattern of houses surrounding it, so maybe an arrangement surrounding that large structure and some others up here. This is a higher elevation, very, very slight. This is a relief of about 30 centimeters is all. But there's a slight rise right here, and there's another rise down here. And we know from other sites in the region that there is a pattern of village and then abandonment and then reoccupation a little bit further downstream. So that makes me want to go down here and expand my survey down here to see if there's another village down there. And so uh, I went with uh, uh, my, my GPR, GSSI SIR 4000 with a 400 megahertz antenna and um, an EM38 MK2 for electromagnetic induction. So here's a close up of this structure in magnetometry. This is the twice as large as all the other structures. So the, the questions we have about this is that is it, uh, is it a townhouse, which is a typical public structure for Cherokee villages, or there are accounts of Spanish explorers when they come to a, um, a village and they occupy it, they uh, ask the, the Cherokee to build them a house just like theirs, but twice as large. So this could be a Cherokee, or this could be a Spanish house. Um, so we want to know what it is. We haven't figured it out from geophysics. But it does show magnetic susceptibility. This is the, the shallower data and then deeper data. It shows that a lot better. It shows the southern um, corner of it. It doesn't show the entire house. Uh, conductivity data, the shallower data, shows it um, a little bit better, but it's kind of, um, the, the survey direction is this way, so this is not drift. Um, but that shows part of the structure, and then as you go deeper, it's down um, below, too deep. And then ground penetrating radar shows the, the structure quite well. And as you get deeper, it also shows evidence of another smaller structure right here, which wasn't very visible in the other data sets. So putting them all together, um, there, I, what I did with these is I, I tried everything that I kind of know how to do, all the tricks of data fusion that I know how to do. And this was the way that I chose to present sort of a, a fusion of, of what I've found so far. And this is just the beginning, so we will be going out um, as soon as the weather allows us to expand the survey with electro electromagnetic induction and with ground penetrating radar to match the magnetometry survey. But what we have, and what, I, what gives me more questions, is that we have a clear outline of this structure, which I believe is a townhouse, with a central hearth in the middle, possibly the opening over here where you would have had an entrance, and then possibly another structure up here. So we have the red showing magnetic, magnetic radiometry anomalies. Um, electro, I have it labeled as electrical resistance because I've taken the inverse values of conductivity. Um, and then I have magnetic susceptibility in sort of in the southern um, corner and GPR uh, multiple slices that seem to show features. So from data fusion then, it's really generating new research questions rather than giving me answers. So the new research questions that I have from this process of interpreting and reinterpreting and combining the data, is the village fortified or is it surrounded by paleo channels? That's something to test with probably electromagnetic induction and <coughs> excavation. 
Uh, is there a second village to the south based on the LIDAR data and known patterns from other sites? Is this structure a, a large, is the large structure a townhouse or is it a Spanish house? Uh, is there a smaller structure to the north, right immediate to the north in those data? And um, what explains the different magnetic and electrical responses inside that structure? Because we have some very different patterns sort of clustered in different corners of that structure. Um, so in conclusion, uh, the data fusion, uh, the whole point is just to say that, that I think data fusion is not just a means to communicate data, but a means of, of creating knowledge. So it's an important step in all parts of sort of the scientific process. And um, it's not only a means for communicating your data, but also for generating new ideas. Uh, and thank you for uh, census for loaning the magnetometer cart and my students for helping me and the land.